Thank you very much for joining me today. It's a pleasure to speak to you all. Um, so I, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what it takes to get LLMs from demo to production. And so why don't I start? Who here has built like a prototype using GPT-4 or Claude or one of those things? All right, so about 30% of the audience has put its hand up. Who's actually taken an LLM to production? So maybe 5%, one out of six. Oh, those odds aren't that great. So let's dive into what it will take to get the other 25% across the line. So uh, what I like to do is I tell you what I'm going to talk about before I start talking, so you can decide if you want to go do something more interesting. But um, really, LLMs, they're easy to demo, but they're very, very hard to productionize, at least in my experience. Um, Along the way, we learned a few lessons ourselves productionizing LLMs that I wanted to share with you so that you don't go through the same painful realizations that we did. Um, and so let's go through that. I'll talk about those challenges with production. And then I want to talk a little bit about what's coming in the future just so we can prepare and you can think a few steps ahead as you move to production. So um, just to introduce a little bit about AnyScale um, and why you should listen to this talk at all. It's the company behind the open source project, Ray. Um, and it's really just a, a, a toolkit or framework for doing distributed computing for machine learning and AI. And so it's widely used within uh, LLM circles. So ChatGPT was trained using Ray. Cohere gave a presentation about how they use Ray to train their models. Um, and in addition, if you've ever used one of these cop, uh, companies' software, you probably have used Ray, you just didn't know it yet. And one of the reasons people use Ray is really because we're faster and cheaper uh, compared to other solutions. Here are some of the companies that have used Ray to extract a little bit more performance or to save a lot of money in their applications. So when we talk about my experience with, or our experience with LLMs, it's really in three things. Number one, we provide LLMs as a service, the Llama models, and I'll talk about that first. Second thing is we actually have LLMs deployed in production to help our users make other LLMs uh, and make other AI applications. And finally, we've helped our customers deploy on Ray, um, and that often also involves quite a bit of experience. So uh, I mentioned earlier that we serve LLMs. Um, we serve uh, them for very good prices. We serve uh, the Llama models, so open models, for very cost-effective prices, so $1 per million tokens. Uh, that is not like uh, a Silicon Valley subsidy number. We are still like above the, red, you know, in the red with these numbers um, because we optimize uh, it a lot. We also allow you to fine tune those APIs. Um, the reason we can do this is because we take the entire stack from the GPU up to the to, to PyTorch and everything else, and to clouds, and we we optimize the hell out of it. So in addition to that, you know, we'll talk about it a little bit more. But we also have a private endpoints offering. So if you're an AWS customer, you want to run an LLM inside your AWS cluster or AWS zone, uh, we can help you with that. And we're just kind of acting as an efficient um, uh, way to do that. We're assisting you in running LLMs. And then finally, if you want to go the whole hog, there's something called the Anyscale AI platform, which is a managed version of Ray. Um, that adds a whole bunch of features like nice workspaces and includes integrations with some of the people that we just heard from. So includes Langchain integration, includes Llama Index integration. We have presentations on our website and how, how to use all of those things. So here's an example of an LL, us using an LLM. If you go to the Ray docs, you can actually ask a question like, how do I take this source code and you paste the source code and how do I parallelize it to use Ray? So, um, it's a very, very concrete thing that we've been working on for some time, and it'll launch next week if all goes well. The second one is kind of a cute application. So many of you are familiar with uh, Jupyter Notebooks. You'll see that there's a special button there called AnyScale Doctor. So when you click the AnyScale Doctor button, it looks at your context, and it analyzes what you're doing and tries to give you advice. So this first example is very simple. Um, you forgot to install import requests. Um, you click on the AnyScale Doctor button, it goes, oh, you forgot to import requests. Why don't you click on this button, and I'll uh, pip install it for you. And it does the pip install for you. Um, now, that's an easy example, but here's a more complicated example where there's like a thousand lines of debugging code. And you can see we run the AnyScale Doctor, and it's crashed, we don't know why, 
any scale doctors diagnosed it and worked out that the cause was because you didn't ask for GPUs when you should have asked for GPUs. So these are examples of us building applications. And then we also we have users who use AnyScale endpoints or AnyScale AI platform, and we've helped them work out how to do it. So these are companies that have real things in production. Uh, Realchar is like a, a virtual character company, and Merlin is a summarization company. So it's a little Chrome plugin. You click on it, and it summarizes the web page that you're on. So let's talk a little bit about what it takes to go uh, from demo to production. So fortunately today at, at the AI conference, I was preceded by Jerry and, and, and Harrison, and they're wonderful people. They're at the top of the field. And they told you all about how do you do things like use RAG um, and relevance and how to do that. So I'm not going to recover what they talked about. What I'm going to focus on is the ones below which is cost, data, vendor lock-in, and deploying LLMs. So I want you to imagine with me that this is the application that you're building. And I want to explain a little bit about why cost and quality are so tricky. So you have, um, uh, you're a company, you build software for enterprises that allows them to summarize emails for you. So instead of reading through a thread with like 20 emails in it, it has a little summary, Bob said this, Jane said this, whatever else. Um, you've tested this, it works beautifully, you've built it in, in, in um, Langchain or Llama Index, use GPT-4 with it, it works great. So what are the barriers you, to you productionizing this wonderful email summarization app? And if someone built this, I would seriously use it, by the way. Um, so this is a hypothetical. So the first problem is that GPT-4 is expensive. And I don't mean just a, a little bit expensive, I mean really expensive compared to the options. So when you compare GPT-4 to, say, Llama 70, uh, it's about 30 times more expensive. For, uh, so we ran benchmarks on summarization. Turns out you have to be very careful with doing this because Llama 70 likes tokens much more than OpenAI does, and OpenAI's encoding is, is more efficient. So, but even if you run the math, you still find it's about 30 times more expensive. So again, I just want you to come with me on this journey. Imagine that you've finished this email application, and it's now time to onboard your company, summarize all the emails that everyone in the company has ever seen. And if you use GPT-4 to do this, it's going to cost you $2,500 per user. So uh, Llama 2, $95, maybe we can manage that. Um, if you think about how much it's going to cost per day, then we're back at the same numbers, roughly $6 a day for GPT-4 and uh, $0.19 cents for Llama 2. right? But a legitimate claim here is Llama 2 is not very good, um, as many people say. Um, and so how can we validate that this cost-saving measure does not adversely impact our quality? Is it possible to save a bucket load of money while simultaneously retaining the quality? So the funny thing is, most LLMs are actually pretty good at summarization. So summarization is one thing that is kind of funny when GPT-3 um, came out, because all you know, people have been trying to work out how to summarize well for years, and then GPT-3 just comes out, and out of the box without any, anything, basically trumps all of the summary techniques that have been invented up until that time. And in fact, they're so good that generally you can rely on them for coherent, fluent, uh, relevant text. But the key differentiator you find out, if you discover, is actual factual correctness. Is this summary faithful factually to the thing that it's summarizing? So for example, here's a task from the literature. This is an established academic technique for, established for determining how accurate LLMs are uh, in, in kind of factual correctness. So what you do is you ask the LLM to take a sentence like this one and summarize it uh, um, and vote on which of the two summaries is better. Is it summary A uh, or summary B? And of course, it's very clear here that the correct summary is summary A, right? Because it's not that there are people shoved in Miliband's head between his ears, right? Uh, but this is sometimes one of the outputs that an LLM produces. So when we run this eval, we see some very interesting patterns. Um, humans are 84% accurate in doing these evals because they rush through it. Um, GPT-4 is on paper more accurate than humans, but you know that's within the bound of error. Llama, Llama 270B is just behind. So 82% for Llama 70B, 84% for human, 85% for GPT-4. GPT-35 Turbo is way behind. 
and Llama 2.7b and 13b are completely unusable. But that's really interesting, right? There is a tiny in decrease in performance, but for a huge reduction in cost, right? So suddenly, um, we could say, well, we're going to stick with uh, GPT 3.5 Turbo, but that one does show a, a decrease in quality. So mechanism number one for saving money. Uh, consider open models. Consider other models other than the big, big companies as you move to production, because cost can be a huge issue. Uh, and Merlin is a great example of that. It may not be cost effective if you use larger models. The second one we've talked a little bit and heard a bit about today is power of fine tuning. Um, so this is a bit counterintuitive, but a small fine-tuned open source model can frequently outperform a very large general model. And I, it's very important to have the in some cases, but here's a task that we asked an LLM to do. So this is one that is very common. Uh, it's converting natural language to SQL. Um, and so the input is basically the human says some natural language, and our goal is to convert that into SQL. And when we ran this test, we found something very interesting. If you just use Llama 2.7b for this task, it only gets 3% accuracy. If you use GPT-4 out of the box, unfine-tuned, it gets about 78% accuracy. But if you fine-tune Llama 2.7b, a model that is what? Uh, according to rumors, GPT-4 is 1.4 trillion parameters, so it's like, what, uh, 1 50th of the size or 1 to 1, 1 200th of the size? Um, it gets 86% accuracy. And again, you do the math on this, and it turns out that uh, for this particular use case, it's, uh, it's like 300 times cheaper. So you might think after talking about this that, you know, it's all sunshine and rainbows and you should use open source models for everything and, you know, OpenAI's future is gone or whatever else. But that's not the reality of it, right? Um, the problem is not the APIs because all of the companies that are providing open source interfaces now basically offer an uh, OpenAI compatible API. It takes you about five seconds to move from um, GPT-4 to Llama 2. Uh, you gotta just change a few environment variables and change the name of the model that you're loading. But there's a few things that kind of crop up. Um, ChatGPT is really good at following instructions. It does what you tell it to do, and I'll give you an example next. Llama 2, in general, in my experience, is not very good at following instructions. It does not do what you tell it to do. And the reason, my hypothesis for this, is that um, OpenAI, their secret source is actually the reinforcement through, uh, through uh, human feedback. They have thousands of labelers around the world that take the output and refine it, and, um, and they then use that through a process called RLHF to fine tune it and to make it even better. Um, so we still end up using GPT-4 a lot. Um, we use it for evaluations because it's like the best grader that we know and the most reliable grader. Um, and sometimes we use it for, for hard queries as well. Um, so let me give you an example of what I mean by open source models, at least the ones that I've seen, are not very good at following instructions. So remember that example I gave you before, you, you give it like a phrase and then A or B, and you ask it, please, please uh, tell me, is it A or B? And sure enough, GPT-4 tells you A. At most, it will say something like answer colon A. But it's not gonna give you an essay, which is exactly what Llama 270B gives you. And remember, you're paying per token, so this is costing you real money when it does this, right? <laughs> Now, it's all very, I mean, you read it and you go, yeah, that's great for reasoning, you know, but it's still very, um, it, it's still not following instructions exactly. Does anybody want to guess how we solved the problem with Llama 270B? All right. Uh, we tried that, it didn't work. We used another LLM that parses the output from the first LLM to decide if the output was A or B. Um, so so uh, there's that. There's also two missing features, I think, that are really critical. One of those is context windows. And this is one where there's a company called Anthropic that has context windows affect how much data you can feed into the LLM. And right now, the leading uh, company in this is Anthropic, and they have 100,000 token context windows. Whereas the Llama 2 models tend to have four or 16, depending on which one you use, four or 16,000. The other one is function templates. And this is a beautiful feature um, that um, OpenAI has created. Um, so say you want to 
in convert something like, I'd like to book a flight from SF to Boston into something you can actually hit a, a database with. Um, what, what OpenAI allows you to do is basically define the format of that like this. And then it guarantees that the output adheres to that format. When I showed you AnyScale Doctor um, um, earlier, I talked to Sofian, who's the engineer who built AnyScale Doctor, and he started prototyping on GPT-4, which is actually a piece of advice I'll come back to at the end. Um, and he had to transition to Llama 2, again, for cost reasons. Um, and the thing he most missed was this feature, the function templates. Now, the good news is people are working on adding this to open source, so it won't be long before we have this in open source. But this is a pattern we'll see. Open source will always lag a little bit, right? There's not multimodal models like there are, you know, yesterday OpenAI released something with uh, multimodal support. That's not going to immediately be available in open source at the same quality level. Um, and so you get this um, very nice um, um, thing that you get with the product with like OpenAI and GPT-4 that you don't get necessarily with open source models. Uh, another question is open AI, uh, is di data and privacy. So one of the concerns when you go to production, you know, we talked earlier about the hypothetical example of the email app, the email summarizer. Um, how comfortable are you, feel, you know, sending all of your emails from, from your own uh, machine and your own company intranet over to OpenAI? Uh, and customers have come to us expressing concerns even if OpenAI gives assurances to the, con uh, to the contrary. Um, um, do you have to tell your customers that you are sending their data to OpenAI? And maybe you even have legal restrictions. So the second thing is when it actually comes to deploying LLMs, you may not want to go with OpenAI. Uh, we've spoken to several customers, companies that are just like, whatever you do, it's got to be on-prem. Our data ne never leaves on-prem. Or other companies that say, it's fine in the cloud, but we never want our data to leave our cloud. So you're going to have to make some decisions uh, about which is better, right? And we're going to dive into the deployment question next. But really, this is kind of maybe a convenient chart to kind of decide which you're going to go with, right? Um, open models do give you more variety. There's more models. There's customized versions for uh, open source. You can fine tune the models. Um, and the deployment um, uh, opportunities also give you more ways to, to handle uh, flexibility and firing. And then the other thing, of course, is there's no vendor locking. So you're not stuck with OpenAI and whatever they do in the future. You can, you can control your destiny. So really, the deployment complexity comes from those first three problems of cost, quality, and data privacy. And if you're not going to run your um, LLMs at OpenAI, what are you going to do? It's not such a big deal with small models. So if you've got like a Llama 7B model, it takes like, you can run it on a G5 2x large, which costs like a dollar an hour on AWS. It's not going to break the bank. But as we saw in the previous example, there are use cases that need the full power of big models like Llama 2 70B. And when you actually try to deploy Llama 2 70B, you discover that you need at least four A100 GPUs, 80 gigabytes each, which if you can get them, who's he, who here has struggled to get A100s for training? All right, so there's, it, it's a real thing to try to get A100s. Um, and now you need four of them, and these things run at $2 per GPU per hour, so it's like $8 an hour. So, you know, what that means is, um, you know, self-hosting is a viable option, um, and we even offer that. So we have an open source uh, software called Ray LLM, um, it's built on top of RayServe, and it supports key features that you need for LLMs like streaming and auto-scaling. VLLM is also good. Um, that's an open source project from Berkeley. Um, but it really only focuses on single machines. So, like, and in, uh, and so you can combine the benefits of RayLLM and VLLM together. Um, Hugging Face uh, used to be nice and give everybody something called text generation inference. But about three months ago, they decided we're going to flip that from open source to closed source. So uh, now there's a, there's a licensing question there about using text generation inference. But you may want to investigate that. So this is for the self-hosted option. But you know, really, the concern with the self-hosted model is, is it's just, um, you know, again, for smaller models, it's OK. But you do the math on this, and it really adds up very quickly. So uh, Lambda Labs, again, you know, this is Lambda Labs provides very cheap A100 GPUs, again, if you can get your hands on them. And it amounts to something like $2 per GPU per hour. But if you compute that over the year, that turns out to be $70,000. So for it to even be break even or close to break even, 
you've got to be running like 70 billion tokens a year across your company. And maybe you have that company, maybe you are that company, and that's the right choice for you. But you also need an engineer to kind of tend to this thing, which is also annoying. So the second alternative is, is something that we offer, but we're not the only people who offer it, is something called AnyScale Private Endpoints. And what that does is you basically give us your AWS or GCP credentials, and we bring up the machines and install the LLMs for you so you don't have to. Uh, and it goes to, you know, you pay Amazon for the, for the machines and you pay us a little bit of a premium for managing the machines for you. And then you get all of these nice features like observability and auto-scaling. And auto-scaling is a big deal because, you know, when these LLMs run out of steam, it's not pretty. You end up with latencies like 15 seconds, 30 seconds. So what you've really got to do is bring another instance online to handle it. So auto-scaling is a very, very big deal for LLMs, but it's not easy to do. So the other option is public open source uh, serving. So this is, um, you know, if you have something less privacy sensitive perhaps, um, or you're prototyping or whatever, it's very cost effective. Uh, we provide AnyScale public endpoints. There's another company called Fireworks that provides it for about the same price. Both of them offer open AI compatible APIs. Um, but again, there's a little bit more flexibility there because both of these options give you the chance to serve fine-tuned models as well. So, just concluding this first section about the difficulties of um, deploying LLMs in production. It really comes down to cost, um, and that's a very, very major factor in that example. So before you kind of start to roll something out, you have to do the math on it, especially if you're using GPT-4 to start. Open models give you a few tweaks with fine-tuning and a few other things that allow and also give you greater control of data. Um, and then there's these different deployment options, self-hosted, assisted self-hosted, public endpoints. So OpenAI would also be in that category as well. Um, um, some open source, some closed. Um, and you can use that to basically give you more flexibility. So um, with that, I wanna just kind of move towards this uh, last part of the section where I've been thinking about what's coming um, and, and, and what the future might hold. So some of these predictions are obvious, especially the second one, I would say. I, I mean, RAG just seems to me to be the first cab off the rank. I think RAG will be the default thing that we see enterprises build. Um, as uh, Jerry pointed out, there are still some tricks and some issues to be worked out with RAG, uh, but it's just such a clean model and it does such a great job of preventing hallucinations. Anyway, we'll come to more details on that. Um, here's a rule of thumb that we've learned the hard way, which is that Increasingly, we're moving towards a world where you just ask an LLM to do one thing. Um, and one task may actually require a suite of different LLMs to use to achieve the goal. Um, and the final thing is, nobody really has fully worked out how to solve the, um, you know, with our existing LM ML models, when we deploy them into production, we do all this stuff to gather new data, make sure there's not drift, retrain the models every week or whatever, you know, we have this thing. I haven't talked to a single person who's talked to me about how they retrain their LLM. And maybe it's because nobody's got them into production yet. But um, I think people will still like, will realize that we haven't quite closed the loop yet on like, improving LLMs over time. So earlier I said that one of the things that we're noting is that um, LLM applications are not a single call to an LLM. And they're not even a single call to a particular type of LLM. So earlier on, I talked to you about AnyScale Doctor. So this is in-context help in your Jupyter Notebook when something crashes. You click on it, it does some lookup, it suggests some fixes, and it even applies some fixes in some cases. But to run that, we actually run, the first stage is a summary stage that looks at the logs and tries to find the good parts. That's a Llama 70B model. Then there's a categorized stage um, and that's another Llama 70B bottle. If this is only even part of the graph, right? If it determines that it's like a node issue or something, it goes down another one. If it determines that it's a Python error, it calls code Llama 34B, which is a specially customized version of Llama that knows about code. Um, and then, it, depending on the error, it will also then eventually call, uh, like, call the Ray Assistant. So remember, the Ray Assistant is like the QA system. It's basically our RAG application is the Ray Assistant. So this is going to become typical in my opinion, right? This is, um, 
So that's part number one. So, so I think that this pattern of many different things is, is coming together is going to be like a key thing in the future. It's not going to be one uh, LLM call. And so you're going to have to think very carefully about integration. The second thing is retrieval augmented uh, generation. I think we've talked about it, um, and I don't need to repeat it here. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the difference between fine tuning and RAG. And it used to be, and now I'm a bit happier, but a few months ago, everybody thought fine tuning would solve all their problems. It's really important to build a good understanding of what fine tuning helps with, which is it helps with the form, the shape of things. Um, and, but it doesn't help with facts. That's what you need RAG for. Um, so I think you've really got to use both. Um, there's still some uh, problems with RAG. So I, earlier I talked about the context window issue. So what might not be obvious is RAG is expensive because you typically generate some, so typically what we would see is because you're pulling all of these documents to help the, to get the LLM to synthesize, the typical input to a RAG is 2,000 tokens. Right? That's, that's a lot of tokens, right? Especially at GPT-4 prices, right? Like, um, their price, I think, is like three cents per thousand tokens, so that one RAG query could cost you six cents just for the input before you even start to look at the output. So um, we still have to work through that. We have to improve the precision and recall issues. So I think this is a big opportunity for the future. So here's an example of a RAG application, the, the one that I showed you earlier, the Ray Assistant. And you'll see that when someone gets um, a request, again, we run a classifier stage that decides whether it should send that to OSS or ChatGPT. So it's going to do the vector retrieval. It's going to get the results. Is it an easy problem or not? Um, that's what I mean by we're going to see things that hybridize both multiple LLM calls and RAG. By the way, you know, this saves us a fair amount of money. So what we did is, in this particular case, 95% of the problems are solved by the open source LLM. 5% of them are going to ChatGPT. You run some math on this, and you know, per year we did the math. It would cost us something like $36,000 to use ChatGPT for all our queries. Uh, it would cost us $900 to use open source. But if we use um, ChatGPT for 5% that we really need it, it only costs us like two and a half, three thousand dollars $3,000 or so. So hybrids and mixes and cho choices are going to be a very much a pattern of the future. So I want to kind of end, uh, um, uh, sorry, I think this is a slightly older version of the slides. Um, but the last issue that I wanted to point out is really that there's not enough uh, thought so far into closing the loop. So this sounds like an obvious question. Let's say your LLM makes a mistake. How do you correct it? That sounds so simple, but I have yet to see something that gives a convincing answer. We know from our research that fine tuning won't fix it. We could kind of create a virtual document with the correct answer and hope that our RAG system finds it. But no one's even worked out how, do you, how you deal with a correction, right? So this is, if, if, if people are going to do startups, um, this is what I think is the, uh, the, 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 the domain that I would probably do my startup if I wasn't having such a fun time at any scale. Um, and so we need to think more broadly about like what are these tools that we're going to use to improve models over time. And you know we have re uh, fine tuning and retrieval assisted generation there. But what I'd like to see is more things on this chart. You know, because um, uh, it doesn't always. Um, I still feel like we don't have enough tools. And RLHF is something that basically there's only a handful of companies that know how to do. And you know, really, again, there's an opportunity here to correct and improve LLMs over time that I don't think people have explored. So uh, since we have one minute of bonus time, I'm going to share my hard-won heuristics from working on LLMs over the last uh, nine months. Um, so if I'm building an app, I'll start with prototyping with GPT-4. Why? Because if it doesn't work with GPT-4, it ain't going to work with anything, basically. You're going to have to wait for GPT-5, right? Um, so. The, the, the second thing is one call, uh, LLM call does one job. Don't ask an LLM to summarize and classify. Have one call for summarizing and one call for classification. This one, this one we learned the hard way so bad. It just like, so we would build a system that does summary and classification together and it would get really bad performance, like 65%. But then we build a summarizer and that would get like 90% accuracy. And then we build a classifier and that would get 90% accuracy. So, 
Um, LLMs cannot chew gum and talk at the, uh, walk at the same time, at least in my experience, right? So you really have to separate out the problem for them. And um, Lama 2 is good enough to be used for day-to-day -day stuff. Don't use it for translations, probably. It's still not good at multilingual. Um, GPT-4 is better if you give it two tasks, but even then, our experience is one LLM call, one task, right? Um, again, understanding what fine-tuning and form is for, um, uh, Fine-tuning is uh, for form, not facts. A rag is for facts, and you should use that. Um, if you can, avoid self-holding. Um, if, especially if you go to something complicated, like a Llama 270B model. Um, if you have to use self-hosting because you're running on-prem or something, use Rail, um, which handles a lot of the streaming and auto-scaling questions for you. So just to summarize the key takeaways, LLMs, there's a few challenges that you really have to learn uh, to deal with as you go through them. Uh, I think what the future holds, and we've discussed cost, data privacy, and deployment complexity. Um, in terms of what does the future hold, really it's a world where applications are more than a single LLM calls. RAG, I think, is going to become the default for the industry. And there are also options that we have about us, like uh, fine-tuning for uh, cost reduction. Thank you. Uh, that's all I have to say today. I will be outside to answer any questions now at 3.30, and then I'll be at the office hours at 4 o'clock. So if you have any questions for me, please don't hesitate to ask. Thanks.